And uh, it is my great honor to introduce Dr. Paul Berry, my esteemed senpai, and one of the most active scholars in the field of Japanese painting today. Dr. Berry received a PhD in art history from the University of Michigan. And after teaching at U of M and University of, Michigan, uh, University of Washington in Seattle, he moved to Japan and is, um, not, uh, is, currently, teaching, uh, is um, yeah, currently teaching at the uh, Kansai Gaidai University. He's also serving as Melon Curator at large for the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Dr. Berry has an extensive list of publications, including exhibition catalogs, uh, Literati Modern, Bunjinga from Late Edo to 20th Century Japan in 2008, and Modern Masters of Kyoto, Nihonga from the Griffith and Pat Patricia Way collection in 1999, both co-authored with uh, Michio Morioka. His article, Utsushi and Interpictoriality in Japanese Literary Painting, was included in Utsushi no, uh, Utsushi no Chikara, edited by um, Shimao Arata, published in uh, 2013. I also want to mention uh, two of just two of many projects that uh, currently Dr. Berry is involved. One is the exhibition uh, and publication of the Cheney and Mary Cowles collection. It's a major uh, private collection of Japanese art which will open next fall at the Portland Art Museum in Oregon. Other is the multi-volume publication project on the history of late Edo to early Showa painting, which will come out from Brio in the next few years. However, his interest goes beyond the literary painting. He researches, writes, and lectures extensively on war painting during the first half of the uh, Showa period and also the uh, war-related contemporary art. Uh, for the next meeting of AAS, he is organizing a panel titled Rethinking the uh, Scope and Significance of Sensoga During the 15-Year War, <laughs> which uh, examines the, in, uh, the overlooked area of the war painting, um, war painting production and tries to comp uh, complicate our understanding of the genre. He says his panel is scheduled on Friday afternoon, that indeed time for any AS participants, so please don't miss the panel. Uh, he arrived in Anava last sun Sunday and has been very busy uh, with viewing and sharing his knowledge on the art museum's uh, Japanese painting collection. He conducted a graduate student workshop on connoisseurship uh, of the Edo period literary painting just yesterday, which was a valuable experience for uh, the gradu graduate students. He's also a noted collector of Japanese paintings, and I heard from him that uh, his house is getting really full uh, with books and artworks, and he's uh, searching a new, <laughs> new location uh, to store them. Um, in today's talk, titled in, uh, The Impending Cultural Collapse, Current Transformation in Japan's Traditional Art Market, he will share his observation as an active participant of the current art market. Please welcome Dr. Berry. So uh, today is unlike the usual art historical lecture I give. Uh, this is, uh, I like to think of it more as reportage than, than sort of an academic analysis. <clears throat> and it comes out of a growing concern that I have uh, in observing uh, the antique markets in Kyoto. I first uh, started seeing them almost unintentionally when I arrived in Japan and for the first time in 1971. Uh, fell in with some people that were very active uh, 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 collecting and they introduced me to a lot of uh, uh, dealers and other uh, people, uh, craftspeople related to uh, traditional arts in Kyoto. And since that time, uh, I've been back and forth to Japan and currently I've spent well more than 20 years living in Kyoto and part of my research uh, deals with paintings that are not so much in public collections but are in the market and so going to dealers to photograph works has always been a big part of my research effort. Uh, so I've had <clears throat> sort of in-depth contacts to know a lot about uh, uh, not only uh, the national scene but particularly the Kansai scene in Kyoto. So there's uh, lots of changes going on. Uh, this is really a much larger talk than we have time for which is probably 
uh, usual for these talks, but I'll uh, try to <clears throat> quickly summarize a lot of major developments that have been happening. I think the, the first inkling I had that things were beginning to change uh, ra uh, radically in Japan about the traditional arts was uh, what I would call the growing collapse of the, the tea schools in Japan. Uh, the Ura Senke the, um, and the, uh, the Monte Senke, the other Senke schools. <clears throat> As you may know, if, if we look at the post-war uh, history of these schools, they're kind of pyramid organizations uh, where you have an Iemoto system and uh, uh, pyramid uh, uh, structures work if you can continually replace the base. You know, if everybody's thinking they're going to the top, then, you know, it collapses. But if you can continually replace the base, it works. Uh, and as uh, those of you that may know something about this were well aware, uh, and for many decades in the post-war world, the, the base was mostly young women uh, that were being uh, uh, introduced by their families, and sometimes even by their friends or other as, uh, entity, largely a sort of a training uh, school, sort of a finishing school, polite manners, kego, uh, refined behavior, and aesthetic sensibilities that were particularly tied into omi system for marriage. <clears throat> so that it, back in the 70s, this was a, a booming business. Uh, most of those uh, young women never intended to, to do more than a few years uh, in the, the T system and would uh, maybe do tea in their private life uh, uh, later on, but not be trying to move ahead in the sort of structured uh, system of exams and advancement that's inside this pyramidal structure. However, uh, as you may know, if you go to Japan and you talk to a woman of that age and say, uh, well, when was the last time you had tea? Or do you know any of your friends that have any interest in tea? Not only will they, I mean, before saying no, they'll, they'll look at you with a shocked expression of, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, and that uh, it's the whole practice of young women sort of axiomatically, if they're of a certain cultural or social status, doing this is long gone. Uh, and it's turned the T-school economic structure from a pyramid closer and closer, we're approaching a telephone pole <laughs> rather than, a, than, it's not like the T schools are disappearing, I'm not saying that, but they're radically changing and they're, not only their economic status, but their social status is dropping uh, rapidly. Uh, back in the, even in the 80s, probably, I, I'm not sure whether I went into the 90s or not, but it used to be in, uh, New Year's Day on television, one of the things uh, that would be highlighted amongst all of this was the Hatsugama. And the uh, Ursenke uh, opening tea ceremony of the year, the prime minister would be there. In fact, the news item was who's at the Hatsugama, and which would be a social pecking order of who's who that got into this exclusive thing. You know, long gone, uh, any idea of doing things like that is, uh, is uh, uh, the Hatsugamas, of course, still continue, but it's not a news item and it's not a social pecking order. Any case, so, so what? Uh, but the so what answer is that um, when you think about it, tea is connected to almost everything. Uh, so you have uh, uh, the metal workers make, doing the, the, the pots. You've got the, the, most of the traditional ceramics, including the Minge ceramics, are connected to the tea world. You have uh, the whole, uh, it's not just contemporary arts, so with a lacquerware, uh, um, uh, you have uh, f uh, fabric makers, you have uh, uh, incense makers, all kinds of the, the people doing the, the takekago, the, the baskets for the flower arrangements, all of this, their financial base was largely connected to the tea school. And so with that shrinking finances, it's racking havoc, havoc in all of these different uh, traditional um, uh, crafts. But it's more than that, it, it affects older artwork too. Um, uh, <clears throat> in terms of calligraphy and calligraphy collections, one of the highest status kinds of things to collect was Shinkan, or imperial calligraphies. Uh, and, and not just recent emperors, but you know, going as far back as the imperial system extends. Um, and uh, 
But how were those used? Who were, who were the collectors? It turns out that most of those collectors were tea people. And they were using them in the, the highest level uh, uh, tea ceremonies. And I noticed uh, that uh, not only was the customer base for Shinkan disappearing, but the prices were dropping like a rock. Uh, uh, and uh, I was thinking, and, and I'm just using Shinkan to represent all kinds of other things. Uh, we don't have time to talk about all the categories, but there's, there's a very high-level category. In any case, <clears throat> but when you think in a normal market where there's something that's been highly esteemed and people have wanted it but couldn't afford it, and the prices start dropping, at a certain point, the people that always wanted to buy it but did, couldn't afford it will start buying it so that you'll have a base. So when this started happening, I imagined, well, it'll drop to a certain point, and then there'll be this flood of other people that always dreamed of having one. They'll suddenly enter the market and buy it, and that'll become the new base. And if there's that active activity is <clears throat> extensive enough, it may start creeping up again. But that wasn't happening. It just kept falling with no end in sight. So I started discussing this with dealers. You know, what's happening? Uh, not just with Shinkan, but all. Lots of different things. And why aren't we finding the base, you know? And <clears throat> in the tea world, part of it is, uh, uh, and this is a very personal observation, but uh, I think the, the, the tea world has long been overly uh, structured. Uh, and uh, the uh, sort of the habatsu of the tea schools and distinction of this and school from that and sort of uh, uh, competition for, uh, for uh, um, new students and so forth, uh, produce very rigid ideas about how you have a tea ceremony. And the problem with the Shinkan is you have collectors that always wanted them that can now afford them, but they're not buying them. Why? And the reason is, according to tea custom, if you have a Shinkan in your tokenoma, everything else in, in, in the set has to be at the same level. Uh, so it implies blind sort of imperial level uh, dogu all the way through, which is, means if you can afford the calligraphy, fine, but you can't use it in your tea ceremony because you can't afford everything else that would have to go with it. Uh, this is just one, uh, um, one example of sort of a rigidity in usage uh, that is having a very unintended but, but massive effect so that it's taking out the bottom uh, so that even people who want to buy aren't buying because they can't use it. Uh, this uh, uh, will continue to other kinds of um, related aspects in a minute, but uh, other things are also taking place. In fact, this whole worry that I have that there may be a, a collapse uh, uh, that is growing in the, in the art markets and, and what underlies the art markets is not a single factor, but a confluence of many different factors that are all happening at the same time to bring about these changes. Uh, other kinds of uh, uh, things that are uh, happening are um, uh, the collapse of the, the Minge uh, market. Uh, uh, Minge ceramics, uh, uh, both uh, current production of Minge ceramics or Minge art forms of any sort, and the Ningen Kokoho system, the national uh, treasure system that often, uh, of which uh, many were sort of Minge type uh, artists. Uh, uh, the level, uh, uh, the f sort of the pricing level of their works is just, again, dropping like a rock. Uh, you can get uh, uh, works by uh, Hamada or Kawai Kanjiro sometimes with Tomobako in perfect condition, nice, for less than you could get uh, uh, go to a department store and get a modern artist's work. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that they're all priced like that, but that's, that's happening now. And, and uh, so there's a huge uh, uh, collapse in that area. And uh, uh, the ceramics, uh, contemporary ceramics, because you know, a lot of attention in America, there's lots of collecting going on, uh, and it's a very exciting field, lots of interesting things happening. However, I was at a, uh, an American collector uh, uh, a major collector who had uh, uh, made a point of getting to know the potters and going to their kilns and buying directly from the kilns, which uh, in theory gives you sort of a leg up and getting the best pieces, um, uh, brought 
three potters together uh, that were, they're not big international names, but they're quite successful. They've had many shows, they've had uh, uh, quite a reputation, they, they, their work sell for uh, high volume. But he asked a very interesting question during lunch was, to what extent is your production dependent on the foreign market? And the three people answered very bluntly. Two of them said if there wasn't a foreign market, they'd have to close tomorrow. Uh, uh, one said that the foreign market only consisted of 50% <laughs> of their business so that if the foreign market disappeared, they could probably limp along. They wouldn't have to close, but it would be you know, enormous uh, uh, setback. But the other two just said it, it would be gone. Uh, uh, so uh, this is, um, again, related to this idea of a collapsing internal market. Um, there's um, uh, department stores uh, have uh, historically played a major role with uh, art uh, exhibition and distribution and promotion in Japan. Uh, they uh, sponsor shows. They have their own art uh, display sections in every major uh, department store. Those used to have uh, the Ningen Kokuho type potters on display and be rather pricey. Uh, uh, you go, I, just as a sampling, uh, I went to Takashimai in Kyoto and there were, um, uh, everything had been remodeled. Uh, the, the, there were now drawers where you could pull out drawers full of chawan that were all 5,000 yen a piece, you know, sort of, not exactly industrial manufacture, but just, you know, totally pedestrian things, and they're just rows of them, you know, pick out the one you want, and uh, the high-priced items were about uh, uh, Juman, if you could, and there were only a few of those, and so the whole thing had just, you know, downsized to just sort of routine wear. There was still a big display gallery that they were promoting a current artist, uh, but uh, of course, the whole area there was uh, nobody there, um, and uh, these um, these kinds of uh, things then are are um, uh, spreading through the market. It's not just uh, so. This is the things that I've mentioned now were the first warning signs to me, like something major is happening. And we often think about cycles, and you can look in the past. And many people have said, well, uh, despite uh, Abe propaganda, America, uh, uh, Japanese economy is really rotting out from the center, is my opinion. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence for that. You can see it in Kyoto, but you can see it in many areas. There are certain companies or, or a certain sector that's doing OK, but uh, People are downsizing their houses. Uh, people are moving to cheaper and cheaper goods. Daily life is changing radically. Uh, and uh, there's a huge uh, uh, cultural and economic uh, uh, sagging going on with uh, things uh, below the surface. It, it, all of this is uh, continuing unabated, uh, uh, unabated. And uh, uh, in the midst of this, uh, the art market for the dealers, the traditional dealers, has been hit hard. Uh, this photograph here uh, is Shimonzen Dori. It's the, one of the main streets for traditional art market in Kyoto. Uh, in the past, and, and we'd have to, when I say in the past, uh, say even 10 years ago, but it, certainly if you went back to the 70s and 80s, this was taken just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the autumn and the spring periods at the peak of the art market. Uh, uh, this street used to be filled with people at this. And this is the peak season. Uh, I think there's one person crossing the street down there and n not going to the stores. But I mean, it's totally empty. The only time you'd see this area totally empty was in January and February in the cold months and stuff. No tourists and, and no local people going around very slow. This is the peak season. Not only is it the peak season, but just behind me, there's a major antique store that's having uh, a matsuri where they have about 500 paintings uh, for sale at amazingly low prices. And uh, uh, it's a catalog-based uh, sale. Uh, and uh, uh, nobody uh, flocking there. Uh, they are making sales, but mostly through catalog things. In fact, the, the on-the-street market for art is so bad that 
<clears throat> a lot of things have, have changed. Uh, uh, more and more stores, if they can afford it, are moving to catalog sales or online sales because nobody will come and look at things anymore. And, and uh, uh, this uh, store that's doing an autumn and winter big sale started that as just a plus to their main business, which is day-to-day -day sales. But they thought they could <laughs> you know, boost their overall thing if they had these big sales. Now, everything's centered around these two sales, and the other sales are, are minimal throughout the year. Uh, so the whole marketing has changed. Uh, prices are dropping so much. Uh, uh, about 10 years ago at some of these places, I'd say, well, here's uh, like a Nihonga work by a reasonably well-known artist. It's in perfect condition, uh, uh, exquisite double box with lacquered outer box, and the price is less than the cost of the mounting if you were to have a mounting of that quality. So in other words, if you were buying it, you're paying for the mounting and the painting is thrown in free. Now you can get things that are like a third of the price of the mounting and the painting is thrown in free. Uh, so these, these things are, are dropping like this. Not everything is dropping though. So what are the dealers to do? How do they, how do they survive? Well, not all of them are surviving. But there's all kinds of strategies. And one is um, uh, another thing that's causing a disruption in the market is that because uh, um, there have been economic and interest cycles before, when you have a depressed uh, cycle, it's a time that bigger dealers would stock up. Uh, they know they're not going to sell them, but this is an authentic thing and undervalued. You, you bring it in now, wait 10 years, and sell it at a profit. Almost nobody's doing that anymore because everybody's so uncertain about the future. And we have an economic downturn, but there's something much larger going on and that may be called a, sort of a cultural paradigm shift, for lack of a better term. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, this is what I'm, this is, this is partly a statement and partly a, um, a question, you know, it, it, there's just lots of evidence that this is a uh, building. Uh, so in any case, the strategy, the de dealing strategy is this, is like buy anything that sells quickly. <laughs> uh, and so dealers are avoiding things that they would normally buy because they don't have a market for it. Um, and, and, and they no longer have the optimism for the future to say it's good, we can buy it now and sell it later. Uh, they just can't afford to have dead stock. So they're not buying good things at good prices. So what does that mean? Even lower or just in growing disinterest in certain things, even among the dealers. But if something is selling, then everybody's just fighting to get it. And this is what's behind the enormous Jokachu uh, explosion uh, of prices, where they're, uh, they're almost, for this one artist, it's almost like the Chinese scene in terms of it's just rocketing like this. And it's rocketing because, well, last year there were four major Jokachu shows, completely unrelated to one another, all large major shows, which also gives you an idea of how many Jokachu paintings there are out there. Uh, but uh, that publicity, there were um, uh, DVDs uh, released uh, about Jokachu and Jokachu paintings and collecting and magazine articles and endless TV specials and all of this. <clears throat> so there's a Jokachu fever going on. But the real fever is the dealer trying to get a hold of these paintings and sell them, which is rocketing the prices so that uh, Jokachu paintings that eight or nine years ago, uh, a simple ink painting with just seals, uh, we're setting aside the forgery problem here, which is huge, but that's too much to talk about. Uh, but just uh, ink painting with seals, no signature, no date, that you know, 10 years ago might have been five or six thousand dollars is, mm, it depends on the topic of course, but could be 70 to 80 thousand dollars. Actually a lot of ripples went through the, the market uh, when there was a dragon painting, fairly small, needed uh, remounting, it's about this big, but a coiling dragon. But again, no signature, just seals. And it's at a mounting shop now, uh, in the dealer auction went for 200 thousand um, dollars. And uh, colored works on silk, signed, dated, are in the, are at least being put out for about a million dollars now, which is uh, 
a million dollars before would have bought a, a Jockachu collection. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's not because everybody loves Jockachu. It's just that if you get a Jockachu, you can probably make a good profit on it and do it quickly. So everybody's crowding on the boat. And there's other artists, it's not just Jockachu, but there's an increasingly small number of artists that are in high demand and the dealers are crowding around them, competing in the, in the markets. And uh, there is a demand, even though the prices, are, I mean, it's one of the, uh, the paradoxes of the art market is that the more expensive, the more it brings out a certain type of clientele and particularly if the prices are rising. So uh, that's uh, you know, driving it. And the other thing is that the whole antique market probably would have collapsed without the Chinese boom, uh, uh, which is not affecting Japanese art, but it meant that there's so much uh, uh, Ch Chinese art in Japan that um, uh, there are Chinese-only auctions going on that are unadvertised in Japan. And there's literally uh, large planes coming from uh, uh, Japan that are chartered jets, not, I mean, big sort of jumbo jet size things full of people coming for the weekend for an auction uh, that only they can go to and then go back. Not one or occasionally, some of these have been going on maybe a, a dozen or more in a year, uh, sometimes five or six in a month. Uh, and so dealers that had no connection or any, any knowledge of Chinese art were just grabbing things and putting them into the auctions and this was giving them a somewhat sideways income that was allowing them to keep afloat. I'm convinced there's still a huge quantity of Japanese or Chinese art in Japan but all the low-hanging fruit is long gone so it slowed down, it's still going on uh, but uh, eventually it will um, uh, you know wind down but it's still um, you know, pretty uh, dramatic. Other things that are happening, the dealing uh, worlds uh, it's, uh, are very traditional, uh, just like craft worlds. Uh, most uh, senior figures, whether it's in a craft world or in a, uh, in a dealing world, don't teach their, their children or their, the, the, the people coming up much about the business. You're expected to just work and observe. And so you're kind of looking over the shoulder and learning by example. Uh, and uh, if there's enough examples, this has w worked in the past, actually. But now there are fewer and fewer knowledgeable people. And uh, so as the older generation is dying off that has massive levels of knowledge, whether in craft or in dealing, uh, that's not being passed on. Uh, to the next generation. So there's a huge drop-off uh, with the people that are coming in uh, who don't know connoisseurship, who don't know a lot of times even the names or how to handle things very well. That's not to say that they're untalented and there are some uh, bright lights, uh, industrious people among them that are doing well, but the overall picture is a huge drop. And this isn't just at minor stores, this includes some of the most important stores in Japan. Uh, and uh, so that's another uh, big uh, issue. And it's also happening uh, with, of course, the collectors. Uh, uh, so the whole knowledge basis of, uh, of appreciation and how to understand art is uh, uh, falling uh, rapidly. Uh, <clears throat> there are even architectural issues. Like I said, this is a confluence of lots of different factors. It's just not one. Uh, uh, so if it was just one, if we we're just talking about an economic uh, problem, we can foresee some point uh, Japanese uh, economy becoming actually strong and vigorous again, and then you think, okay, then people will go back. Or you think about generational change. It, it was traditional in the last 50 years that uh, people in their 20s and 30s weren't so interested about history or older things, but as they grew older, they developed those interests and went into it. But we're not seeing that so much anymore. And, and there can't be so much confidence about that going to happen. I think an economic revival will obviously help, but it's not going to bring things back to the way they were because people, when they want to buy things, will buy other things. Uh, they won't necessarily go this uh, route. Uh, this is um, uh, architectural problems is that even wealthy people with exception of the extreme wealthy, are downsizing their houses and their living circumstances. Uh, so that means that they have collections from the past that they no longer can store. They can, 
They're, they were usually uh, collected by the grandfather or great-grandfather, previous ancestors, so they really have little knowledge, a little interest that's just filling up space in the house. So those things are often being dumped out with little understanding of their value, uh, sold sometimes for next to nothing. Uh, and uh, on the buying side, uh, there's a, another problem, and this is a mentality, it's connected to the tea world, but it's broader than that, and that's the idea, you can't display a scroll without a tokenoma. This head, head mindset is so strong, and so very few new apartments and houses in Japan have tokenomas. Those that do are often ornamental tokenomas. In other words, they're sm so small or badly designed that they don't function well and most people never think of putting anything anywhere. And mostly they don't even go to that extent. And so people would say, I'd like to have this, but I don't have any place to hang it. <clears throat> I'm constantly explaining to people that Tokenomas never existed in China and Korea, <laughs> and there's thousands of years of people hanging uh, scrolls and displaying them on wall surfaces, and it's not just Westerners who do this. They know Westerners do that, but, you know, well, Shogun I. But actually, the whole history was, you know, it's only Japan, and this is not an attack on the tokenoma, which is a wonderful art display system, but in the current world, the number of them, uh, if you can only ha have a calligraphy or painting, a scroll mounting, if you have a, a, a tokenoma, then you've written the death knell of this whole thing. And so this mindset needs to be changed. But when I point out that China and Japan have scrolls and are doing it all the time, it's always like, oh yeah? Really? They don't have tokenomas? You know, I mean, basic information uh, like this is uh, lacking among everyday people that are still interested in art. Um, the whole art uh, publishing uh, thing is another, art education is plummeting in Japan. So let's get to a few images here to just give you some more ideas of some of these or, or examples of this. The, here's, here's this uh, sale I was talking about that had hundreds of works for sale. Some of them are modern framed works. Um, of course, uh, works can be cut out of scrolls and framed and that happens. It usually is uh, not good for the work, but, uh, but that's one so-called solution. But this is at the height of the, uh, of the sale, uh, and uh, I didn't have to wait for people to get out of the way. <laughs> this is, uh, <clears throat> and uh, lined up like this, uh, they've uh, got price tags mostly except for the really expensive, the most expensive ones. Uh, the items here at this sale, the top items are mostly at fifty or sixty thousand dollars, and there's only a handful of them. If you went to the same sta sale uh, like fifteen years ago, there would be the top items would be multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars, and and uh, <clears throat> and and more of them. Uh, so this is the place where you can also find good works that uh, uh, at a percentage of the mounting cost. This is at an auction uh, uh, place in Kyoto uh, that, uh, and this, these are mostly tea wares that you see here. Uh, one of the most, uh, uh, the aging head of one of the most important uh, art uh, dealers in Japan told me one of the things that's happening, he himself, uh, due to age, cannot do Seiza anymore. And even though there are chairs for this, he says it's just not the same. He can't stand to do a, a, a chakai sitting in some kind of chair, so he's just stopped. Although this is one of the most important participants and patrons of the tea world in Kyoto. But he said it's not just him. Most of the people of his age bracket and, and the old chajin. Uh, and the old chajin don't have uh, important uchideshi anymore. And so they don't have anybody to pass their collections to, so these tea collections are being dumped on the market with very little active, uh, 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 you know, buying up of, of things. And so th it's another thing leading to the collapse in prices. These are um, uh, uh, kogo. These are the incense containers. Raku Chawan with uh, 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 signed boxes. Uh, Mo, these are really Kante boxes by later uh, Raku uh, people. Those boxes up there, uh, the two, the, the, the center and the ones and the two on the left uh, 
or I, I have um, Conte by uh, uh, um, well, they're Ichinu uh, uh, bowls, but they have a, a Conte by Rionu and other uh, other later uh, 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 tea people. So one thing about these bowls, uh, this is a Rionu Conte for a Sanyu bowl. Uh, this is um, uh, these bowls. Uh, this is at an auction, but if you're just looking at the the minimum price, and and you're comparing the minimum price of these bowls to say uh, the antique mark in the 1970s, uh, that bowls without a box, no attribution uh, of undetermined origin, old, nice in various ways, were actually had higher prices in the 70s than boxes uh, with you know high quality attributions, pedigrees, and and uh, you know ex pretty much what they are. Uh, do uh, in today. And, and of course that's the minimum, so you're thinking, what is the maximum? Well, I mean, what are the prices, really the, the realized prices? And you look at the auction results that come out in the T section, the number of sales is mostly white space. And uh, most of them didn't sell at all, even at these low prices. Uh, lining up scrolls, there's, this includes lots of forgeries and other kinds of things, but you have Butsuka there, you have various schools, um, and, uh, but in the, in, the, in the back side of that you have the racks and actually most of them that, that, that are being sold are not out at all because there's so many. I mean there are hundreds and hundreds of works um, and they're put out kind of randomly which always amazes me. In other words, a lot of the best works aren't even being displayed. In, in other words, which gives you uh, an impression that although these are serious auctioners who are, are rather knowledgeable, can't really uh, assess what they're selling very well because they're, they're definitely not putting their best foot forward. This is an Okahara Seiko uh, uh, um, uh, orchid painting. And this is an example. Screens are, are, are particularly bad shape because of the size, you know, the storage size, display space. Who, can, who, who has space for a screen today? Uh, so this is a, a pair of, uh, of calligraphy screens. And even though this is a very important early 19th century um, calligrapher, Ichikawa Bayon, they didn't recognize it and put it up as, a, as an anonymous screen for Goman Inn, and somebody bought it for just over Goman Inn. I thought it wasn't going to sell, actually, but it did. And uh, it's the Bayon signature on the uh, left. It may be a little hard to read if you're not used to these things, but, uh, but this is a very classic, easily readable signature of a noted uh, 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 calligrapher and uh, good uh, seals. On another level, uh, uh, here we have uh, Jumbo uh, Jankara, which is a, uh, a karaoke building there on the left, and Game Panic. What do these two buildings or these two businesses, it's really the, what do these two sites, I guess, have in common? Yeah, I don't think you could ever guess by looking at this. Uh, the root base in common is that uh, the building on the left was built by Marazin for their, that was the old Marazin building. And they sold it and it was empty for a few years and it's karaoke. Uh, on the right, it was Kinakunia in Kyoto. <laughs> and a uh, big uh, two floor Kinakunia the, Kina that's now Game Panic. Uh, and uh, this is, um, the collapse of the bookstores as a whole. It's not just the art bookstores. Uh, and uh, uh, so what do we have instead? We have uh, a new company called Book First that's pushing its way around and trying to say books aren't dead yet. And, 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 putting, and they took over a space that ha had been a privately run space. I mean, uh, it's also a chain, but a, a small chain rather than a big national chain. So the big national chain just took over. It, and you can see even here, bookstores are in more and more obscure places. This is a fairly big neighborhood bookstore, but it's on the second store. That's their advertising, you know, so it's pretty obscure. Uh, that's their, when you get there, but it's a, it's a big store on the inside. <clears throat> but what happened when the, the, the bookstore was taken over? The previous bookstore in the same space, for the history section, the history section had, if it was this room, had bookcases of the same size going from here to that wall. Uh, but in the new one, you have uh, uh, 
the history section being just uh, these uh, section here, this, uh, this part here, these two bookcases, total history. But what's in the history? You know, it, it, you could, in, in other words, the history section went, was cut down to a, less than a quarter of what it was. And it's not just the history, but all of these older disciplines were uh, scrunched. And if you made a careful selection, that's still space. But what kinds of things do we find there? This is a, a the, as you may be aware of, the extreme right wing is having a monstery in Japan under the Abe administration. Uh, it's been, it's not so much that the Abe administration is directing this, but they feel so emboldened that magazines and other things are coming out with all these kinds of stuff. There's so many Nanking books now. Here, I don't know where they got the Yonju Man. I never even heard anyone say that, but uh, even in China. But Yonju Man Nin Janakte Sanju Yonin died in Nanking. And they're using uh, uh, propagandistic newspaper, magazine footage from that time as real evidence, you know, as what happened in uh, uh, Nanking. Um, if you look a little bit at this book, their argument is actually that the whole Nanking story was uh, a U.S. plot put forward during the occupation to cover up uh, the firebombing and the nuclear bombing. The firebombing and the nuclear bombing is, in fact, an issue that needs to be returned to and re-examined in a totally new way. That much is true, but, but so it's a clever stratagem, uh, but then they go into just, among bogus arguments I've never seen is anything as bogus as this book, uh, but this is one of the things that, you know, survives in their history section. We turn to the art section. It's art sections and even these bookstores used to have a lot of art books and, and now there's four shelves. But what's in the art sections? It's just miscellaneous random things. If it, if it has an image, it's art, you know. It could be any kind of image. In fact, you're moving um, from bijutsu, it's really going for, from painting, it's going to illustration. And illustration type books are expanding all over the place while uh, things dealing with either contemporary or older art forms are just shrinking and shrinking. And so you can uh, see for yourself on those titles. Um, Marazen disappeared after that, but after a period of some years of absence, they came back in the ball building and did two rather enormous underground floors that are advertised in this manner on the street. <laughs> It's like they're embarrassed to use the word book. <laughs> you know, like, this is their sole advertising for two, uh, so, and it's, a, it's a, a building full of uh, miscellaneous fashion and so forth. In the bottom two floors is an enormous bookstore, but that's the advertising. Uh, <clears throat> so this just gives you a sense, but this is coming down the escalator and you can get a sense that there's two big floors. They're actually quite large. Uh, and quite deserted. This is the, this is the, uh, the art uh, uh, section. Again, this is in the middle of the day on a, on a weekend. Uh, there's one person. Uh, and in art, though, also it covers everything. They actually have a very nice cinema section. This is a cinema, and that goes in the art section, and actually I approve of that. But there's uh, uh, lots of miscellaneous other stuff that uh, were formerly in other sections have now been sort of relabeled as art and brought in. But even more critically, uh, those of you that know about art publication in Japan know back uh, really from the 90s and earlier, the publishers were always competing with these large format series of histories of Japanese art that were meant for home consumption, written by high quality art historians, but readable for anyone. Uh, all the major publishers had them and they were really renewing them every 10 or 15 years. That's all stopped. Uh, and the only thing we have left is a really high quality one by Kodansha, this uh, Nihon Bijutsu Zenshu that came out, or it's completed after about six years of publication just recently. It's supposed to be the popular version for people to buy 15,000 yen uh, volume. It really has new interesting topics and, and excellent scholarship. And this is how it's displayed. It's, uh, it's still in the book uh, shipping uh, thing. In other words, you can't open it. So I, uh, let's see, uh, there we are. Uh, 
It's got a very strong tape sealing it. I'm sure you could take it to the counter and they'd be, oh, you have an interest in it. Sure, we'll open it for you. Uh, but it prevents any browsing or any sort of thing. And most stores don't even stock it. Or if they have it, they have one or two uh, volumes. And, and these are uh, sealed. You know. They're so pessimistic that anyone will even want to look at this, uh, that, uh, uh, although it's very high quality. But all of the older series are gone. Uh, in fact, the only way to really get those kinds of things is on the used market. And the used market, they're vir virtually giving them away. Uh, 30 volume set, like uh, of the classic Genshoku series, which is uh, out of date, but still the, most of the information is very uh, good and uh, quality illustrations. 30 volume set, you could maybe get four or 5,000 yen for the whole 30 volumes, you know. Nobody has space for that, uh, much less uh, the interest. So uh, these are um, problems that are going through different, uh, uh, the art problem is not, it's dealing with architecture, it's dealing with cultural trends. Lots of people like to always, you know, knock on uh, anime and manga, which are certainly, I'd say they're no longer expanding actually, they've gone into a slight contraction, but they're still massive. They're much more massive than one could have ever predicted. But I don't think those are the causes of anything. I think they're somewhat symptomatic of the situation, uh, but I don't think they're driving uh, this. And it's other things that are, are larger that are going on. Uh, and <clears throat> of course, uh, historically, uh, there was a, a bookstore, a big Kyoto bookstore, that was one of the main stores. It's no longer there. But they had a big art section. And this is, this is an old story from about 20 years ago. I went into it. And it was all gone one day. The whole, whole art corner was gone. It had been replaced with computer books. Uh, and and uh, uh, art section had been moved over to a few shelves in another part of the, so it had been greatly compacted and moved over. Of course, these are <clears throat> not so much aggressive attacks by management, but probably reflecting sales figures, you know. And so uh, it's um, uh, emblematic of these things that are going on. So it's, um, it's a, a, a problem that, we're not just talking about markets. Uh, the markets uh, uh, are one aspect, but it's, it's a kind of a canary in the coal mine. Uh, there's, a, there's major changes, and it looks like it's not just an economic change, but cultural shifts, uh, that, and uh, cultural shifts that are happening in, in interest levels of res respect or levels of understanding for uh, traditional arts, uh, and um, uh, it's... Uh, changing all this. This doesn't mean that museums are going to close, although in fact some have closed. A lot of them are in uh, red ink uh, territory every year. But I don't, I'm not so pessimistic that they'll disappear. But the, the, the appreciation for them is, is weakening and uh, it's so big that uh, uh, there are uh, the collecting of art, the preservation of art is having a huge effect on the preservation of art because if you have this, like if you have a bunch of screens that you inherited and you take them to a store, or you, have, you can't take them to a store, you have to have someone come look at them and they say, well, these are very nice, they're high quality, but there's a little damage. And almost all screens have some weakening or damage somewhere. The price of repairing them is more than the value of the screen. So uh, when you can't... Um, uh, repair it, uh, they're dumped. Uh, art is literally, even art recognized uh, artists are being dumped. Uh, and uh, so this is a, a major uh, issue. Yeah. And, uh, and it's not unconnected to global trends too. And it has to do with education and, and so forth. Uh, the book publishing, all of these different factors are coming together uh, to making a perfect storm that's being very hard on some aspects of the culture. So when we uh, look at it, you know, this is a few photos from the Tokyo National Museum display that were taken four or five days ago when I was there. Uh, this is a, a noted um, uh, Kuro Oribe uh, tea bowl, this kind of uh, work, or this is a section of a famous Hoitsu uh, 
hand scroll. These things aren't going to be thrown away, but the audience for them and the people who know what they're looking at, because people look at them and say, hmm, this is art, this is famous. What is it? What am I supposed to be looking at? How am I supposed to understand this? Uh, it's uh, those kind of roots are, that used to be very widespread in the culture are shrinking. So when people are gathering in front of Kawanabe Kyosai's enormous scroll of a, a hell scene, uh, uh, they're uh, you know, looking at art but also wondering about it and we're there looking at the future. And you don't have to be living in America to feel like the future is an unknown territory. Uh, so let's go to questions. If we've got some time for that. Yeah. What becomes of all the precious objects that are dumped? Do you scavengers take them? Or well, I don't have a lot of, uh, all I can do is give you an anecdotal uh, uh, story that's kind of interesting that I had a froshki with four or five uh, uh, boxed uh, uh, kakajiku there and the taxi driver recognized that given the shape of those things, it must be scrolls. So he said, are those kakajiku? And I said, yeah. And he says, I'm making a collection. Uh, and he's making a collection from things found on the street <laughs> uh, uh, when he's driving around the city of Kyoto. And he says he hasn't found any major artists, but you know, he's finding scrolls, not just Hadaka or just without a box, but, uh, but in boxes he's finding tea bowls and miscellany. And so anytime and he's driving around, oh, there's something, he picks it up and puts it in the trunk and then checks it out later. And gradually, I don't know, he had 20 or 30 and it was growing. Um, so, uh, I mean, peop things are going into Ogatagomi. Uh, and uh, there's... Um, there's auction worlds go through lots of levels, and there's a very low level where things are just, you know, sold in big lots without people even looking at what they are, like 40 scrolls, 5,000 yen, you know. Uh, there are some foreign dealers in Japan that are buying up things like this and sending back uh, uh, containers of stuff and then having sales in San Francisco and Seattle and other places where the things are being uh, dumped out. These people have almost no idea of what they're doing. Uh, I mean, they have some decorative sense or they can tell something about the condition or that sort of thing. But uh, ironically, I, I know someone uh, that has actually, uh, he too doesn't, I mean, he vets them through me. He finds things that are interesting and sends them. And there's been some major uh, major uh, screens. Uh, I mean, not major in terms of, <laughs> national treasure, but in terms of very high quality, there was a very high quality mid-17th century screen in good t condition of, uh, that turned up uh, recently. Uh, and uh, earlier in that, uh, uh, a Yuhi screen of bamboo, uh, uh, that 12 panels with silver mountings in excellent condition, was uh, being given away even after being transported to the U.S. I mean, they, wherever they got it, they got it almost for free to sell it. I mean, some of the prices, the sale prices in the U.S. are less than the transportation uh, costs. And they can do that. When I say less than transportation, if you had one screen and tried to send it, it's really expensive. But if you have a container, you know, you can just sort of throw things in and it's so diluted over the content that it, that, uh, it, it gets close to zero. So, yeah. <clears throat> well, you'd think so, but uh, I'm glad you brought this up because what about foreign collectors? Uh, what's happening with the foreign thing? Because th this is a uh, this is a real uh, a different side of the, the the problem that's also kind of disturbing in the United States is that um, compared to Chinese art, there's never been a really big collecting base for Japanese art here, and if we're looking at major uh, uh, prominent, that is to say it's in the news, in the newspapers, or on television, or reported by museums. There's only been a handful of major uh, uh, U.S. collectors, and they're all aging uh, on the point of stopping. A lot of them have stopped, and, and several of them have died recently. And there's not, there's a few people that seem to have some 
interest in doing something like that and the capabilities for doing it, which is a different important aspect. Uh, but basically it's looking like, and museums are worried about this all over the country, is that there's no clear-cut next generation of American collectors of Japanese art at a, at a major level. And, and, and this is, uh, uh, and, and to top it off, uh, when these uh, recently deceased collectors or people that are, are at least wanting to deaccession their collections at the end of their lives, uh, there had always been assumption that some of these collections were kind of going to go to U.S. museums, and, but uh, two or three of the collections are turning up largely to go back to Japan. Uh, uh, the reasons are too complicated to go in here, but it's been sort of a shock uh, to the museum world where they thought that, you know, there'd be a certain basis of things. And there's a lot of ironies involved because the ja Japanese pub uh, public overall, the average person on the street, you say, Japanese art in America? Oh yeah, all the good stuff's in America. That's a very common perception. You go to an American collection being displayed and you listen to people talking and you say, oh, all the good stuff went to America, it's just gone. And they have no idea that Japan has done a better job of preserving their collections and the, the, than probably any country on the planet. And, and the, but there's this media uh, thing that it's all overseas and you go there and it's so sad. It's wonderful to see, but it's so sad because nothing is here. And, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Uh, this has just happened so many times to me, I can't uh, believe it, but this is part of the, f the people saying that know nothing really about art, and it's a media uh, image creation and, and so forth. Uh, the only thing that foreign collections are strong and compared to, to uh, Japanese collections are, uh, uh, are ukiyo-e and uh, tsuba, uh, um, you know, small uh, netsuke. Uh, those collections, there are better ones overseas. But all the so-called serious arts, Japan is <laughs> just like, uh, you can't even like, the Japanese uh, quantity and the foreign collections are kind of, you have to excavate to find the comparison. Uh, so, <clears throat> so it's a big question and it's a big uh, worry, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, Chinese art, which has been massively undervalued for about 100 years, is now attaining what's actually, on a global level, more appropriate levels. In fact, if you look on a global level and even look at the highest levels of the prices in the Chinese market, it's still lower than similarly ranked uh, European artists from the same periods. Uh, so uh, it only looks shockingly high by com because everything's been shockingly low for so long. But we're in a shockingly low for Japan uh, basis. But the I mean, it's unfortunately not in China that everybody's an art lover and this has happened. It's basically an economic investment plan. And, you know, people have a lot of money and they're looking for rising prices. Prices have been skyrocketing. So huge amounts of money have been going into the Chinese art market. It's nothing to do with art. They pose as, I'm making a museum or something like that. It's all investment for the most part. So I actually had a, a different question. Mm -hmm. And the question is, um, uh, how do you explain, for example, the Jacques phenomenon? Um, what, what particular artists, producers get, um, you know, sort of foregrounded, get sold, uh, displayed? Um, well, so it, and it, who else besides Jacques Tu? I'm kind of interested. Well, yeah, there's, uh, you know, a lot of the Rimpa artists are endlessly popular. Rimpa is always endlessly popular because it's a very high quality, sophisticated artistic tradition, but it requires very little training uh, to know that. So you can know nothing about Japan, which could include a lot of the Japanese populace that have not been trained in any of this, and look at a, like the Hoitsu section, I say, and say, that's amazing. You know? uh, so uh, art forms that require little uh, education. So those that require a lot of education, like my specialty, or once my specialty, uh, 
uh, literati painting, which generally requires to full appreciation, you should be able to read cursive scripts, uh, understand Chinese poetry, and um, not only Japanese painting history, but Chinese painting history. Uh, asks a lot of you, you know, those kind of things are like, what's this? Okay, there's a mountain, and there's a house, and there's a figure over here. Hmm. There's another one, you know. Uh, so uh, it's these things that are more easily understandable. And, and actually, this is part of the, th the thing where art is becoming uh, illustration. Now, illustration, I'm not against illustration. There's fabulous illustrators. Uh, but one, and this is a great generalization, but one of the, the things about illustration as opposed to, quote, art, I mean, this is a very slippery kind of uh, thing, but uh, is that it, it tends to have more direct appeal. You know, in terms of colors or complexity or uh, direct emotional uh, targeting of certain emotions or sentiments. And, and so uh, uh, it can have a strong, that's why it's used in illustration. That's why illustration exists, is, is that it has that immediate sort of grab you kind of quality. And so that is expanding. Uh, and, and that's <coughs> uh, um, part of it. But it's very complicated, you know. It's not like uh, you're going to find a sesho in the garage sale, you know. Uh, it's uh, famous artists are still highly valued. And when we look at the values that I've been talking about, the elite stores are trying to hold the line on the prices. They may be sometimes getting them cheaply uh, uh, because they're out of favor. But if they're in favor, how do you get it? You get it by buying back from older customers with no competition. In other words, when you're in a dealer auction, and most art is traded in dealer-only private, you have to be members of a club to join the auction, uh, these very secret kind of uh, 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 auctions. Uh, but there you've got full-scale competition. Uh, while in, um, uh, if a, somebody bought this, or somebody in their family bought it 30 or 40 years ago and wants to sell it, um, and that's another difference. Uh, People are almost, uh, in New York, they almost brag about, oh, I'm getting rid of my Rothko's, you know, yeah, just moving on. Yeah. But in, in, in Japan, the idea that you're selling art is like a real social stigma. Uh, and so people are usually trying to conceal uh, that they're selling. Uh, and, uh, um, and so they often go back to people that they bought them from. But they're being, since the market has changed, they're being bought back often at a fraction of what they were paid and without competition, so the dealers can then do that. But this is only possible for well-established, high-ranking stores. The average store has little access to that. Um, so, yeah. Elaborated a number of institutions that um, you know were generating the sort of collapse of mm -hmm. the art market. I wondered uh, about universities and training mm -hmm. and history of art, for example, and also some of the art schools. Mm -hmm. uh, how seriously are they taking you know the picture that you're painting here? Well, the picture that I'm painting is like not common knowledge in Japan. I don't see um, newspaper articles or magazine articles or TV discussing this thing. But it's been very common knowledge in the dealing world. Uh, and, and I think uh, academics vary. A lot of academics in Japan keep the dealing world at, a, at an arm's length, and they're not too involved with it or they even intentionally do it. But that's not everyone. Some of them are, are you know, go to dealers frequently. So uh, it's, uh, I think that the, on the scholarly level, I think people are just trying not to think about it. <laughs> They're thinking, uh, if it's brought up, it's kind of, oh, there are cycles that are happening, you know, uh, the economy's bad. Uh, but uh, I used to think that too, but there's so many indications that something bigger is happening. And I'm not wanting this to happen, obviously. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I'm uh, thinking it's time that it should be public knowledge and there should be open discourse about it. Uh, but that's not really happening that I can see at universities. The university art, art history programs, they have students, and, the, and some of them are doing extremely well. In fact, if we look at the curatorial level at museums and, and um, the professors, there's often a very high level of knowledge and skills. But it's not, um, it doesn't have a big support base. Um, so those people are into it for very personal 
motivations and their interests and so forth, and they're achieving good things. But before, there was a wider support base of, we know why you're doing this, or the, I don't do this, but I respect it or value it. And I'm not saying that people don't value it at all, but it's getting more and more uh, attenuated. Uh, like the Nichi Obijutsukan, you know, they bring in manga artists to talk about Muromachi painting because that's the only way they feel like you can get an audience. Uh, and, and they bring in television talents and other kinds of things, all of this sort of stuff. Oh, if you pry away their often kind of lame comments, there are sections of that program that are doing some hardcore things that are very well produced still. But how do you get the audience? Uh, and, but uh, media is so important, even uh, at Nichio Bijutsukan, it's uh, an hourly, weekly uh, uh, NHK uh, production. In the last 10 minutes, they cover about six or seven shows happening around. If you get your show mentioned, even for a minute, there's an enormous uh, spike in attendance. So m museum curators and people are struggling to try and get that 60 seconds in Nietzscheo, because they know if they do, they're going to have you know, a successful exhibition, regardless of the topic. So it's, um, it's, but it, it shows that museums over the country are competing for a weekly 60 seconds on a TV, one TV program shows you how weak the media uh, uh, you know, promotion of art is in this sense. You know. uh, so it's, um, there, but uh, on the scholarly level, very good things are happening, I think. Uh, there's lots of good students and there's, they're doing well and there's talented people. And, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but partly this gets to a national level, though. When we look at the national level, we've got another picture uh, 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 this is kind of a, uh, an unrelated, well, it's not unrelated, I'm mentioning it because it is related, but a few years ago I posted online in various places about uh, the Bunke, Hokai, or the, the collapse, or the abolition of humanities. There were some very aggressive statements coming out from the Abe administration about uh, universities, they're talking about national universities, should really abolish the humanities. Uh, and this was uh, not just art history, this was law, <laughs> and this is uh, history. Uh, all of this should be, you know, it's irrelevant. And, and, uh, and there was a big uh, dust up, and I uh, put online uh, stuff about that from, this is like August, late August in 2015, if you keep your old email uh, things. Um, may still be lurking there. I want to do an update because the next year there were books published about it. Uh, major magazines pointed out this is a big con controversy of the year, 2016 I'm talking about. But at, by the end of 2016 and the beginning of uh, 2017, the dust had, had settled quite a bit and uh, part of the statements had even threatened that, that universities not doing this would be subject to undisclosed penalties. As far as I can know, but this is the problem, is nobody's researching it. As so far as I know, those penalties haven't uh, uh, materialized. Uh, there was a major magazine that surveyed uh, the national universities and actually got the presidents of, of about 50 national universities to respond. Only one of them openly got on Abe's um, wagon and all the others were equivocating or, or in some way. Some of them made strong statements in support of humanities. Uh, but, uh, but I think in retrospect it was a, uh, something that we may be familiar with that some, some people, uh, and this is when I use the term Abe, I'm not saying exactly what he said, but his sort of regime, if you look broadly. Uh, 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 it's like Let's scare everybody and see how far we can go without actually changing anything officially. In other words, let's intimidate it. I mean, uh, uh, you say something really awful and everybody pulls back and feels intimidated and threatened or you're doing something with the humanities, you wonder you're going to be, you know, have a, a, a blowback from the government. And it's not all, it's important, the books that came out uh, about this uh, pointed out this is not all new and it's not all Abe, but there's a, uh, the Bunkacho and, uh, and uh, the Mambusho uh, is a very large organization. They're not all of one mind. 
there's some people that I think we would all be very happy with, but there's other people that are very different. And those other people that are very different are actually part of the problem. In other words, some of this is actually coming not directly from the leaders of government, but from the Mambucho itself. Uh, there's factions in there that are very aggressive and doctrinaire, and this is, you know, this is where some of this is coming. In any case, some of these books try to chart the various factors, and, and uh, again, it's a complicated picture. Uh, but it's not just there. When, when in, in response to that email uh, 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 notification about those things that are happening in Japan, um, I got people saying, well, you know, it's not just there. Things like this happen in the U.S. And I just wanted to mention this thing about uh, STEM. You know, we need to recognize, and I say we as I, I'm, I feel like probably everyone in this room, regardless of who you are, is probably a supporter of the humanities, realize that STEM is not an, uh, a neutral acronym. It's a slogan. It's a political statement. Because once you say that those things are STEM, and you say anything else, then STEM, well, it's the center. It's what everything comes from. So you, it's what needs to be preserved more than anything else. And so in the acronym itself is a political slogan. And so I would urge people not to use that term in, in talking about these problems. I have a suggestion. I know this is... Uh, you know, comes out of Cervantes, but I have a su suggestion uh, that, uh, that something like Mets. <laughs> now, once you get over the, the baseball, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing, that's not the intent. Mathematics is underlying engineering, technology, and science. Why should that not be the first thing if you're taking those four as a unit and trying to make sense of them. Mathematics is key to all of them, so why shouldn't M be the first letter? And to make it uh, pronounceable, then we have METS. But if you do that, then you're looking at the content of what these things are. You're not creating uh, a biological uh, uh, metaphor uh, that settles the argument before it's entered. And, and uh, now, uh, going online, just in preparation for this, it's in Japan. STEM K, using uh, Romaji with K after it. Uh, so uh, people say, this is really a great concept because you are really settled the argument before you even entered into it. And that these are primary, humanities are always secondary, they're frilled, they're, they're, you know, what you do if you have time, you know inessential, unimportant. So uh, this, we need to think, I mean, this is always true, it's not a new phenomenon, but these acronyms are, are very uh, uh, influential. But uh, obviously there's a lot more to talk about, but uh, uh, any, uh, we have a, a minute or two. Does any, anyone else uh, have any other questions? Get back on the topic. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, um, if, uh, I mean, th thank you very much. There's so much to think about here. I appreciate uh, all that you brought up. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you can help me make some sense of probably the seven total hours I waited in line for three major mu uh, museum exhibitions in Japan. And like how, one is the Koko exhibition, uh, um, the Shosoin exhibition just finished. You know, that always gets a huge number. You know, the Umke and then Momiyama, all these, like just huge ways of huge numbers of people. Now, I mean, at the Koko exhibition especially, I didn't feel like, I felt like most people weren't looking. They were just checking off boxes if they were doing anything. But what is that, what is that group? I mean, well, yeah, I can explain this quickly. So we yeah. can just jump uh, to are the explanation. Are they history classes? Are they oh, no, 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 nothing. Okay, so it's what? all media hype. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's all the uh, museums are in trouble uh, financially. And so uh, uh, they're um, uh, all focusing on how to have blockbuster shows and putting as much money into advertising or more money than into the show itself and, and driving up advertising and magazine articles and other things to uh, net uh, information and stuff to make a frenzy about this. But what you have then is 
like four Jokichu shows in one year. It's a ridiculous, you know. I like Jokichu, he's a great artist, but this is ridiculous. Uh, and, and, but it happens, you know, endless uh, shows of this artist or endless shows of that rather than, uh, the curators aren't behind this, but their curators are being forced to do it by the economics behind it. And then the government has done something terrible to the national museums. I don't know if you're aware of this, it's not new, it came in uh, some years ago. They, they decided on this, um, you know, uh, uh, museums should pay for themselves. So the, the museums going semi-private was, we'll still give you money, but now you have to generate money. And what's really uh, uh, ki killer is that they want the museums to be totally self-supporting. And so the museums are being driven to have more shows, more blockbusters, more this, more that. They're not increasing the staff, so the staff uh, 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 risk workload is going through the roof. And, and um, the more the museum makes, the more the subsidy is cut. In other words, if you, if you add a million, you get cut a million. <laughs> so in other words, your hyperdrive is just treading water. <laughs> There's no economic progress at all. It's all leading to the idea of no government support at all and a totally economic focus. This, uh, this leads to the, the metaphor for you museums is an entertainment business. You know, uh, and, and you, you're competing with any kind of entertainment uh, site, and uh, it's really moving in that direction. Because this is happening in the U.S. too. Uh, but but in, in since the national museums have such an important role in Japan and, and have so much of the major art, that it's really affecting them. And the curators have, like, Curators are always hard up for research time, but under this thing, you know, they're just scrambling and, and also it's cutting like some of the, in the Tohaku, they expanded the exp exhibition spaces. They didn't expand the number of curators. So how do you double your exhibition space and have the same number of curators? They're setting up everything. Shortcuts in every direction. So uh, they have a... Uh, in the second floor of the, of the Hong Kong at the Tohaku, there's a, the special national treasure room, you know, where there's one thing out. Of course, that used to be a whole gallery full of things. Now they just shut down the cases and have one thing. It's not really about focusing on those objects. It's about saving curatorial time in, in, in not having to prepare the display for that room. You know, these things are happening uh, uh, all over. Uh, so it's... Uh, there's no easy solution, but the first thing is to be aware of them and then to be speaking about them and communicating with other people and, and developing some kind of response. So, I don't know, maybe that, that helps you out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.